Um, we're at six o'clock Eastern, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, this is, I guess I could should turn my video on here. Um, this is Cindy Finiseth with the Kentucky Horticulture Council. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, this is night three of our three night um, vegetable short course. Um, we've had two fantastic evenings of content. And of course, tonight's not going to be any different. We've got two great speakers lined up. Um, you know, this series was really a direct response to people asking for information of, for beginning growers. Um, so that's why we're really talking um, small scale, you know, getting started. So if, if you have a lot of experience, you might be just a little bit bored tonight, but I think you'll still find some good information. Um, for those of you who uh, are just getting started, don't be intimidated. Um, we're going to cover just really some basic information, give you some ideas of places to find additional information when you're ready to, to you know, move on past what we've talked about this evening. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, this is webinar style, so our attendees, you don't have to worry about your video, you don't have to worry about audio, um, you know, it, it can be as loud as you want or need it to be there, it's not going to bother anybody. Um, if you do have questions, um, you know, you can drop those into the chat or into the Q&A box and we'll be watching that, monitoring it, and we can pass that on to the to the speakers. Um, so we, you know, or if you just have comments or suggestions as we go along, feel free to drop those uh, into the chat box. Um, the link is the same if you need to drop off and come back in, no problem, you can do that. Um, and also we're recording everything. Um, so if you missed uh, some content earlier, uh, you can go back and uh, view that. Or if you want to refresh on something you heard uh, during these sessions, you can go back and rewatch. And we'll send a link out next week to all the recordings to that email that you use to register. So you'll, you'll have those to do. And then finally, when you log out tonight, um, there'll be a survey that pops up. And we would appreciate it if you would complete that for us. Let us know how we did, what we can do better, if there are other topics that you would like to um, hear about or, or, or resources that you need, uh, feel free to let us know about that. So I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk, so I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Rachel Rudolph. Uh, she's an extension vegetable specialist at the University of Kentucky. Um, if you got to hear her last night, I'm sure you enjoyed it. Um, so this is like round two uh, for Rachel, and she's going to go through some of the small scale equipment considerations uh, for vegetable producers uh, here in Kentucky. So Rachel, please. Okay, well, we'll just jump right in here. So um, equipment does matter, tools matter, right? The quality and the, the type of the size, the scale, it all matters um, for the success of your farm. So vegetable production is very labor intensive and it very frequently relies on hand labor. Um, someone actually needs to be out there you know, multiple people actually need to be out there. There's very little automation, especially on a small scale. So a lot of Kentucky growers, successful Kentucky growers, um, don't have a lot of automation at their disposal. Um, here and there, you know, there are perhaps some, some high tunnel automation or some conveyor belts out in the field, you know, that kind of thing. But overall, a lot of it is um, just people out um, hand labor. So the right tools are really important for the success and viability of a farm, um, efficiency matters. And so um, equipment and tools are necessary for every aspect of vegetable production from seeding to harvest and then even on to post-harvest, right? So having that right, the, the right equipment for you is gonna make all the difference. So some things to keep in mind before you buy any equipment or tools, right? So um, the location of your farm, it's going to matter, right? So um, can you rely on other people around you? Are you near a store? Um, are you way out in the boonies all by yourself? Um, do you, are you on hills, um, flat ground? Um, you know, that kind of thing, keeping those things in mind, um, the growing conditions, um, types of crops being grown, that's going to be a huge one for what kind of equipment you're going to need. Um, your production practices. So um, to a certain extent, right, are you a conventional grower? Are you an organic grower? Are you trying to 
um, grow sustainably? Are you trying to limit your use of fossil fuels? You know, your production philosophy will really um, weigh in there. Um, the type of your market, the type of market that you're going to sell at. So are you going to be restaurants? And so you might be harvesting multiple times a week. Are you going to do um, auctions, maybe a big harvest um, all at once? Um, you know, those kind of things are going to matter a lot. And then, of course, the size of your farm and the volume of the business that you plan to do. So um, you can see the tractor here in the picture, right? This is something that, um, you know, if you have just a one acre farm or a two acre farm, right, two acres of vegetable production, you probably don't need a tractor this big, right? And you you may not need this water wheel setter. Um, it doesn't mean you wouldn't benefit from it, but it you may not, you may not need it. You probably don't need it. And um, you, you probably can't justify the cost. So determining the right tools for the job can be, sometimes can be trial and error. Um, a lot of it, you know, talking to other growers, um, talks like this, right, and hearing what works and, and what may not work, um, right, that can be really helpful. But sometimes it's really just person individually dependent, right? So what you like the way a certain tool feels in your hands or the way a certain um, piece of equipment functions, that, that can be um, fairly subjective. So it may just be person, each person's opinion and their, you know, the way that they operate something. But in general, there are some things that, you know, all tools or equipment should have, right? So that you want them to allow for efficient work. So you want to minimize fatigue and you want them to be ergonomic meaning that it works with your body, right? So it's not working against you. Um, something fits in the palm of your hand well, right? Like a handle is nice and it's grooved and it doesn't cause blisters and it doesn't wear on in a certain part of your hand, for example. Um, that's what I mean by ergonomic. Um, the tool should be safe to use, right? So um, you know, sometimes we get free stuff and it's kind of questionable and maybe, <laughs> maybe it's better off. Um, there's a reason it's free, right? You get what you pay for. Um, light and easy to transport. So, you know, sometimes this isn't always ideal or sometimes there's really no way around that. Um, but if possible, try to, you know, your equipment again, should not be working against you. So, um, if you're a one person, you know, farm, um, you need to um, think about how easy things are to move and get around and get in and out of the back of a truck, that kind of thing. Um, ready for immediate use. So um, minimal adjustments um, should be required. Um, those kind of things that cost time and money, um, right? If you're fiddling with you know, trying to adjust a uh, cedar um, and you spend two hours doing it, right? That's that's huge. Um, of course, there's a learning curve to, to some tools. And so you'll get better at things as you use them more. But in general, it shouldn't be a, a you know, a lifetime struggle with a piece of equipment. Um, and then durable. So, um, you know, quality, Quality matters. Um, I just had a trowel break the other day, right? Just bust the handle, just busted in half, right? It was a cheap trowel. Um, you know, try to avoid things like that. Um, think about um, things that are going to last. You won't have to keep replacing them. Um, sometimes paying a little extra money up front really pays off in the long run. Um, just better materials. Okay, so we're going to jump right in. So these things that you see here, this is for larger scale, right? But this is the kind of things you need to keep in mind as far as just soil preparation, field preparation, right? Um, and I will show both large and small scale to give people an idea of, and kind of in between of where you could be or what you could be doing, you know? So, um, Mower, right? So if you're taking down, this is um, a clip from um, taking down a cover crop. So we mowed this cover crop, we use this mower, um, and then we followed with a disc, 
right? And you can do something similar with smaller equipment. And I'll, I'll go into some things. So you can have a walk behind rototiller. So this is very manageable. It's a little bit, let's say it's a little bit more challenging to use than just your standard lawnmower that you'd have at home. But um, it's pretty straightforward. One person can operate this. One person can move it around, right? Um, thinking about there's, this is a field cultivator. This can be pulled by, this is a pretty small one. This can be pulled by a pretty small tractor. The, we have another one at the farm that is probably two, two times the size that is operated by a larger tractor, right? And so these tines come in um, and they break up weeds. And then this um, circular component, again, this is for small weed management. Um, so you can do, again, you can do a lot just with this rototiller. Um, working the soil, um, breaking up those weeds, um, getting ready for um, planting, right? This piece of equipment can do a lot. Um, but if you're really into weed management and really the, you know, the mechanics of physical weed management, um, and soil preparation, this is a, this is a great um, implement. So then of course, there's really small, um, really um, easy uh, tools you can find almost anywhere, right? So a personal favorite of a lot of small growers and high tunnel growers especially is the broad fork. So this loosens the soil up. It's not meant to invert the soil you stick it in the ground, you stand on it, um, you are holding it here with your hands, you stand on it and it's just loosening the soil. So this is really great um, for keeping the soil structure intact. You're not disturbing things too much. You're not inverting the soil. Um, it's just loosening things up, aerating it a little bit. Um, and this is a, a very popular tool for a lot of small growers. Um, and then of course you can have a kind of a smaller version with a, kind of like a pitchfork type of situation. And then of course shovels. So have high quality standard tools that you know could pretty much do triple, quadruple duty around the farm, right? This um, piece of equipment, the tilther, I really like this. Um, and there is a video, so this photo is from Johnny Selected Seeds. Um, there is a video actually on Johnny Selected Seeds if you want to um, watch it operate. So you put in a drill, just like a battery powered drill. I'm trying to find my cursor. And there's a string here that attaches to the drill and is basically pulling the trigger of the drill. So when the drill is on and it's turning, the tines on this thing are turning. And so um, it's super light, very easy to use. It just gets the first a couple inches of soil nice and loose. Um, we've used this in our high tunnel. Um, it's also great for just lightly incorporating um, fertilizer. Um, it's a very handy tool. Um, very easy to use. So, okay, so you've done some soil prep. Um, what about getting ready for planting? So um, this is something we do a lot. We use this woven weed mat and we burn holes in it. So you can do it a couple different ways. You can do quick, quick and dirty with a blowtorch here. I'm just burning those holes. Or you can do with a um, this this uh, implement does kind of double duty. It can be for weeding or it can be for burning holes. So if you put this um, handle directly over the weed mat and just hold it, it makes a very nice, clean, perfect circle. And so if you're um, a tidy person and you know wonky circles make you uncomfortable, then um, you'd want to go with something like the picture here versus the blowtorch. Um, but super handy, you can buy this kind of thing at Lowe's, it's pretty cheap, um, and you can get a lot of holes burned um, 
very quickly. So things for, you know, smaller acreage, um, high tunnels, that kind of thing, this works really well. So I talked about plastic culture a bit last night. Um, here's an implement, again, this would be for a slightly larger acreage, um, but super handy. This is a plastic layer, bed shaper, um, also lays drip tape, um, all in one. And then this box here, this hopper is for fertilizer. So you can put dry fertilizer in there. You need to calibrate it based off of um, how fast you're going to be going and your the the area you're going to cover, right? Oops. But super handy. So it puts the fertilizer down before it covers the bed with plastic. So it's shaping the bed, putting fertilizer down, and covering it with plastic and drip tape all in one. So amazing piece of equipment. <laughs> um, very handy. Um, okay, so let's, so thinking about getting started, right, and transplant production, you can kind of do, you know, you can do the hand seeding if you're, if you're doing your own transplant production, you can just seed things by hand, no problem. Um, one step up from that would be using this dibbler here. So, um, and it comes in different sizes. So this one's for a 50 cell tray. So this is the underside. So you can see there's potting soil on this. So you're gonna turn it over, right? And push it into the cells of the tray, right? You're gonna have potting soil in that tray and then you're gonna push it in and it makes nice, perfect little holes. So you don't have to go through and boop, boop, boop with your hand, right? Um, it's just one shot makes these holes and then you can seed. The next step up from that would be something like a vacuum seeder. So you attach a vacuum to this end um, you can, it depends on, you put the seed in and you, depending on the, again, you're going to have, depending on your tray, right, that you're going to use the 50s or the 72s or the 128s, those kind of things. And then it will put, it's kind of like a dibbler and it seeds everything for you all in one shot. So this kind of thing is if you're doing a lot of trays of the same kind of thing. Um, and you want it to be fast. So if you're just doing two or three trays of a variety and then you're gonna swap varieties, this may not be worth your time. This thing would, regardless of like how many you're doing or anything like that. Um, and you can see, you could probably make this if you had some patience, right? And a little bit of carpentry skills. Um, but the vacuum seeder is very handy. I know um, Rick just used it recently, and I think he was really um, grateful for <laughs> grateful for having it. So, um, yeah, transplant production. Um, let's say you're going to be doing some direct seeding. There is something called the Jang seeder. They make other brands like this. So you put the seed in here. Um, again, you calibrate it based off of how close you want the seed to be planted. So things like beets and carrots and lettuce and um, radish, things that are commonly direct seeded, you'd put in here, you'd calibrate it, you'd put in a specific um, brush based off of how um, close you wanted the seed uh, to be placed, right? And then it drops drops down here, right? drops down here. So um, they also make these in where you could see multiple rows at one time. So there'd be like three or four or five or six across um, with this. So it's pretty impressive. This is just a single row, um, but same exact thing. It just look, it has several wheels and several just spouts here where it's going to drop the seed. So if you're doing a ton of lettuce or a ton of beets, um, right, something like that, um, and you you just want to do one pass on a nice wide bed, um, you'd want to get, and you're, and you're doing that frequently, you may want to get something that's multiple rows um, at one time. Um, am I missing some questions? Okay, um, I'll answer that in a second. Um, okay, so planting, right? So of course there are, 
You can do trowels, right? So you burn those holes um, in your in your weed mat and you use a trowel to just dig a small hole and you drop your transplant in, right? That's, that's an easy, quick and dirty way. We do that in our high tunnels. You know, it takes a little bit more time, right? Than the water wheel transplanter. Um, so the trays, your trays of your transplants go here. Um, this of course has to be pulled by a tractor. Uh, people sit here and then you drive over a bed a raised bed, right? So this is all part of plastic culture. You're gonna drive over the raised bed. These tines here are gonna make holes for the transplants to be dropped through. So um, <clears throat> very easy, again, larger scale, right? If you're doing a lot of transplants, you're, you know, nice. Um, this is also something to keep in mind, nice long rows would make this go faster. The part that slows this whole process down is when you have to turn the tractor, right? You are done with one row and you've got to turn it around and go into another row. That is the part that slows this down. <clears throat> um, it can also, so here's a tank, so you can put fill this with water or you can fill this with fertilizer and water and it'll drip down through these, through these, um, tines here. And so each transplant gets a little bit of water and a little bit of fertilizer. Okay, so weed management, um, of course, right, the handy, there is um, numerous amounts of ways to uh, deal with weeds, right? It's a lifetime struggle. Um, so this is a kind of a handheld weeder. It can get really close to the plants. The thing with this, right, is you're going to need to be basically down on your hands and knees to work with this. Um, the stirrup hoe, this type of thing is, you know, the weeds can't be terribly big with something like this. If the weeds are really big, you're going to need kind of this standard, the, the regular hoe. Um, then you can have, there's all different shapes. Um, shaped kind of like a spade right here. That's for smaller weeds getting really close to the plants. Um, and then this wheel hoe, this is pretty amazing. Again, not, not, you know, the idea with weeds are it's much easier to manage them if you um, get them while they're small, right? So if you've got a, um, if you do it regularly, it can be kind of a quick thing if you wait until the weeds are gigantic, it's gonna be hard. So this wheel hoe, you'd push it behind um, and this stirrup here just takes them out and it's very handy. So keeping in mind, right, your equipment and your the size of your beds and the spacing of your plants, right? So. They make smaller wheel hose, more narrow wheel hose. So um, some, keeping that in mind when you're buying stuff, like what's your standard planting distance? Um, are, okay, is this something like this wheel hoe is gonna be used for walkways, right? To keep walkways clean. Usually you wouldn't be able to use this, you know, between plants on the same bed. That would be too far apart. Then there are these flame weeders. So you can have just the handheld thing. So it's a backpack or just, a, you know, a propane tank in a backpack. You can do that. Or you can do walk behinds and that you can do a really gigantic one, right? Like this or slightly smaller and a little bit more ergonomic, right? This one is probably a little easier on your back. And that goes through um, and kills the weeds with flame. So again, though, these are most useful when the weeds are smaller. Um, if they're really big, they might bounce back even when hit with some fire. Um, that's how, you know, weeds are stubborn. And so getting them when they're small is going to be the best option. So another mechanical way to deal with weeds, here's a mower, walk behind mower. And again, you could pull the rototiller out and, um, you know, invert the soil, disturb those weed roots. Um, this again would be more for an alleyway type of situation if you're during the season or, you know, prepping the soil, getting rid of those weeds before planting. 
And so here's a shot of this mower in action. So these aren't weeds, this is a cover crop or a uh, ground cover in between rows. And so we were knocking it down um, and it gets pretty close. You can get pretty close to the bed um, with this thing. It's actually quite nice. Um, if you get too close, you'll rip the plastic, but um, you, can, you can do a lot with this mower. Okay, so pest and disease management, of course, um, sticky cards are not really a way to manage pests per se, but a way to um, scout for them so then you can manage them if you need to. So I recommend everybody have these in your field, in your high tunnels, um, in your low tunnels, right? Um, blue and yellow are great for attracting different, different pests. Um, and then I'm not going to talk too much about sprayers because I believe we have a speaker um, later on that's going to talk about sprayers, but they, again, come in all shapes and sizes. So this, this blower, um, this, you can't see this one, the, the front of this one, um, but it's like a tank and it's pressurized. Um, this is just your standard backpack sprayer. Um, so depending on the coverage you need, the droplet size you need, um, the scale of your operation, um, it's going to really affect what kind of backpack sprayer you need. And I believe Dr. Sean Wright is going to have a video on that later. Um, so here's some fertilizer applications um, options. So you can have just real simple, uh, this connects into your irrigation line and um, you fill this with water and fertilizer, the right amount of fertilizer that you need. And um, you open up this valve and it through suction, it will draw that fertilizer, that soluble fertilizer into your irrigation line. So that is a, an easy way to fertigate. That's um, frequently how we fertigate in the high tunnels. Again, you can do this. So this would be a pre-plant type of situation. So prior to planting, you could use this thing to the tilther to incorporate um, fertilizer. So you calculate how much fertilizer you need. Um, you could, and then you could broadcast it, right? And again, this is small scale, um, broadcast it as evenly as you can, and then go through and incorporate with this little guy. Um, here's a mobile um, fertilizer injector. So they, out at the farm, they attach this to a little, you know, quad, a little, um, I can't think of the word, a quad, I guess, and um, drive it to different fields and inject fertilizer into, you know, based off what they need at each field. And so that's, this is something they rigged up, right? And welded this little wagon. Um, greenhouse systems and larger systems, you know, and even in high tunnels, you can get a more of a uh, fertilizer injector, kind of fancier setup. So there's two tanks in this system because this is for a greenhouse. And I'm not gonna get too, too into fertilizing and different types, but um, in some cases you need to keep you want two different types of fertilizer for soilless culture and you can't mix them. They can be mixed in, in the line, in the drip line, but you can't keep them in the same barrel. And so that's where that is. So you've got two injectors and two separate barrels. So irrigation, um, I believe there is still um, a cost share for something like this. So collecting the rainwater that comes off your high tunnel, um, this is still something um, I believe is out there through NRCS. Um, so all the, you put a, you install gutters and where's my cursor? There it is. You install gutters and all the water that comes off the tunnel comes into the tank and then um, you apply that water through deep irrigation to, to, your, to the crops in your high tunnel. Um, as I said last night, drip irrigation for vegetable production is highly recommended for um, water use efficiency, um, disease management, right? You don't want a lot of wet leaf material. So 
um, plants take up water through the roots. And so directly applying through through these um, through drip tape, directly applying that water to the roots, to the soil, that is the most efficient way to do it. Um, something like this is kind of handy. Um, it is a kind of a fancy tensiometer. So these lights um, on this device here, um, when they're all lit up, that means you're good on water. Um, when, the, when you're low, so there will be less of these little lights here, then you know that you need to water. So this cable comes down and there is um, an implement that you put into the soil. It's important that you install it correctly, but um, that can be pretty handy. Okay, harvest. Um, really, the tools that you need to harvest are really going to depend on the crops that you have. But in general, you'd need several sharp harvest knives. I really like this one a lot. Um, the edge of it is really nice and sharp. This is great for um, broccoli, um, stuff with really thick stems, um, very handy. You can get a nice clean cut. Um, also, having really good quality harvest bins is, it sounds very simple, but it really matters. And having a variety of them is also really nice. So, you know, something like this would be good for lettuce. Um, these actually, they can stack above one another. So right now they're stacked into one another, but if you swap them around, they can stack. So they're not touching really, just the ba barely touching each other. And so that's really nice for things you don't want to get smushed, right? Um, these baskets are very handy for, you know, um, stuff that is heavy and you don't want too many of them on one thing, right? You don't want to overload yourself. Um, very easy to move and stack and, and that kind of thing. So really, and they're all made of very thick plastic. So these things get used by every group out at the research farm and you rarely see a broken one. They're just very sturdy. And so really investing in quality stuff like that that you don't constantly have to replace. Um, notice they all have air, they all have holes in them um, for air movement. Um, things, you know, tomatoes sitting on top of tomatoes and there's no air movement, um, that's a recipe or lettuce too, that's a recipe for just really soggy, um, gross post-harvest conditions. Um, so speaking of post-harvest, there are some, so having a, a cool place, preferably temperature controlled to store your, um, what you've harvested is really important. Um, there is several, there are several, um, publications on this cool bot. Um, it's quite um, affordable. You, it's basically an air conditioning unit that's been programmed to, you know, run at cooler temperatures. You can set the temp. Um, so uh, knowing what, pro, what your produce needs to be, um, what temperature it needs to be stored at, that's going to be really important. Um, storing stuff, um, not together, you know, knowing what can be stored near each other and in the same room, that's also going to be really important um, components, but, and I'll include this resource at the end of the talk. So some season extension, I talked about this a little bit um, yesterday. So this um, hoops, you can have larger, smaller hoops, right? These hoops and some nice thick row cover and some rock bags that goes a long way for season extension. That's what we're using tonight, for example. So this is a fairly recent photo. So this is a very thick row cover, 1.5 ounce. We don't use any other, um, we don't use any heat in the high tunnel and, and this stuff has done fine so far. Um, sometimes um, growers feel the need to use a, a propane heater, um, but just be really careful with this kind of thing. Um, you can also have a more permanent thing installed in the high tunnel or in the greenhouse, but make sure it's ventilated, make sure a professional has installed it and then it's working properly and it's not leaking. Um, I, every spring I get um, several emails 
of um, damage from propane heaters to vegetable crops. So it acts like a pollutant. Um, vegetable crops are very sensitive to uh, this kind of damage. Um, they'll curl in on themselves. It's a very um, obvious symptom um, when there's been a heater leak and the plants have been exposed. So here's just some other miscellaneous things so that I like and recommend. Um, you've probably all seen something like this, this bucket organizer. Um, this is really handy to just, you know, keep your stuff in, haul it out to the tunnel, haul it out to the field. You've always got it ready. We've got a bunch of different tools in here just in case, right? Um, just in case we need stuff. Um, these snips, um, I've fallen in love with these little guys recently. They're very handy. They make a nice, clean, crisp cut. So, you know, if you're pruning things, um, you don't want to tear, you don't want to pull. Um, having a nice, clean cut is going to help um, prevent any future disease issues or pest issues, right? That was open wounds. That's, that's bad. They're just usually bad for, you know, leading to disease. And then this... Um, no, this is not for baking. Um, so for small growers, and I recently had this conversation with an agent, um, for small growers, usually applying pesticides, um, we're putting in a tiny, tiny amount of a pesticide, right? So um, sometimes, you know, a measuring cup is too big for, you know, often a measuring cup is too big for what we need. You may need something like this, or even these little teaspoons, tablespoons. Um, the last recommendation I made with someone, it was three quarters of a teaspoon, right? And so having these around and of course having them labeled and separate so no one mistakes them for anything that you could use for food, right? So keeping it with your pesticides and keeping them labeled, right? That's important, but having um, a set of these that you can use um, to apply pesticides is handy. So here's some resources, um, understanding equipment costs on small commercial vegetable farm, right? This is a CCD publication, um, rain fed irrigation video. If you're interested in that, that's um, a video that Brent Rowell and I put together. Um, if you want to learn more about larger scale equipment um, for soil preparation, this video um, is preparing a soil for cover cropping, but um, it's still very applicable, you know, if you were going to put a cash crop in, right, uh, there's still several steps in there that would be the same for cash crop. So kind of interesting. Um, there's a publication on transplant production, um, weed management. There's this link leads to a huge amount of other links for irrigation. So um, there is a publication on rain fed irrigation if you'd rather read versus watch a video. Um, and then there's just one for regular small scale drip irrigation. Um, shared equipment directory, I spoke about that last night. Um, very handy for. Um, people who, you know, don't want to buy or can't buy a piece of equipment, there may be something near you that you can borrow, um, like a plastic layer, bed shaper. And then here is this low cost cold storage room for market growers. So if you search this University of Kentucky AEN-96, that's the publication number, you'll find this publication um, very handy. Uh, and this is for the, the cool bot um, implement that I showed you for post harvest. And with that, I'll take questions. So the first one is, what's the most effective way to pull up the black mat at the end of the season? Um, are you referring to black weed mat or black plastic? So if you can answer that. So for weed mat, um, we usually do put staples in that black, that thicker woven weed mat. And there is a tool that can help you pry those staples up. Um, a crowbar goes a long way, honestly. So having nice thick staples that you can pull up easily 
um, with a crowbar that that usually works really well. Um, we often try to reuse our weed mat. Um, so we'll sterilize it for the next year, that kind of thing. Sometimes we can't, you know, the holes aren't the right spacing for the next thing we're going to put in. So we'll pull up that weed mat and save it for next year. Um, as far as black plastic goes, if you're trying to clear black plastic, I think I spoke about this last night, um, you'll come through, there, there are actually specific implements for removing the black plastic mulch, um, but there is a way to do it without. So you can go through, you'll mow down that crop that is in the black plastic mulch, um, and then you basically go through with the, the bed shaper again, and you'll basically, it lifts up the black plastic out of the soil. And um, then you can pull it up with your hands relatively easy. So it's, it's not, uh, it still requires some human labor in there, but it's pretty easy, especially if you get to it quickly at the end of the season versus letting it sit in the field for several more months longer. Um, any other, let's see, any other questions? Okay. Um, I'm looking, I'm trying, I'm checking these. Yeah, there are a couple things in the chat, but I'm yes. glad you brought up that shared use equipment list because um, it hasn't been updated recently, but there are a ton of pieces of equipment that are available for folks to use. Um, so if want to be sure everybody takes a look at that to see all the different things that are available. And even if you don't see something on that map, still call your county office and ask a question. It probably will not be available through the extension office, but they can connect you with the right group. If it's the Soil Conservation District or it's the Cattlemen or it's Farm Bureau, you know, whoever in the county that administers that shared use equipment. Um, but just because you don't see it on that map, um, still call and ask some questions because there may be some pieces available. And I dropped in the chat that at our cars in Eastern Kentucky, um, Sean Wright has a piece of equipment that can be borrowed to lift plastic at the end of the year. Um, so if you're in that geography and you're interested, um, check with him. You can um, email me or you can Google him, whatever, to get his contact information, but he'd be happy to help you out with that. Yeah, so I see something else in here. Um, we do have a, a temperature stick, a temp stick is what it's called, and we bought it off Amazon. Um, you can link it to your phone. So we have it in the high tunnel and then um, we can check the temperature of the high tunnel, um, you know, from your phone at home type of thing. So for people that maybe don't live right next to their high tunnel, this could be really handy. Um, or if you're, you run errands in town and you're trying to, you know, monitor the temperature in your high tunnel, that's very nice. Um, the one we bought, we bought one last year and it was a little on the cheaper side um, and it didn't last. Um, it was maybe 60 bucks and it didn't last a year. Um, this one we bought, so far so good, we'll see. It's in the $150 range and um, it monitors, uh, I don't think it monitors humidity. I'm not, for a high tunnel, I'm, you know, we, we raise and lower the sides enough that um, we're not as concerned, but I think I, it does monitor temperature. Um, and then, okay, so the next question is, what are ways to prep a site without a tiller? Um, so if you have a large patch of grass and don't want to buy or rent a tiller, how can um, you prep the site for small scale veggie production? So it'll be hard, but you can do it. So, you know, I, I mow it. Um, and then you, you know, with a hoe, um, you can pull up the grass. I've done this before. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for anything on any serious scale, um, but um, you know, a shovel and a hoe can go a really long way from lifting up a grass and basically, you know, I'm working the soil that way. Um, and then maybe use it that tilther, so the little thing um, to incorporate. Um, it's, you know, again, it's going to go maybe two, three inches, um, four inches at the most um, to incorporate some fertilizer or something like that. Um, that would be maybe the best approach. So you'd be hand tools only probably if you don't want to use the walk behind tiller. Um, 
they do rent, but um, you can rent those the little BCS walk behinds as well. So if this is a once a year kind of situation, it might be worth your time to <clears throat> time and money to rent something. Um, <clears throat> anything else? So Rachel, I have a couple of questions. Um, and I want to point out that I did put some links in the chat there. One, you mentioned that about um, a gutter collection system for rainwater um, and wanted to let everyone know there is a cost share program through the Kentucky Office of Ag Policy that's a 50% cost share um, to put those kinds of uh, upgrades into your production system. So that's something to check out. And if you have questions, you're, you're welcome to, to check with me after that after this about that. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the equipment. You mentioned that quad for the fertilizer application. Um, so some pieces of equipment you would have to have a tractor for. Some pieces mm -hmm. of equipment you could use a four-wheeler, a quad. Yeah. A, so how do you know the difference? Like just when you're purchasing it, there, it has a different hitch on it. It has, you just would ask the manufacturer. <laughs> Yes, so the, you know, the piece of equipment would, it would be pretty clear through, you know, if you're buying it through a dealer or something like that, they'll be able to tell you, um, yeah, this can be pulled with um, something smaller, you know, certain amount of, this needs an X amount of horsepower to, to move, right? Um, or um, <clears throat> if it has a PTO, right? So the particular end of the implement, right? If it has a PTO, it's gotta be pulled with the tractor. You know that right off the bat. Um, and some things can be pulled with a, you know, a very small tractor. So something a little bit more accessible for a lot of people, um, you know, something that's basically the size of an orchard type of tractor. We use that a lot in the high tunnel, a very narrow um, thing that's, you know, not much bigger than a four-wheeler, to be quite honest. Um, so yes, the manufacturer will be able to help you. The dealer, if you're buying it from a dealer, they'll be able to tell you. Um, if you're buying it online, certainly the instruction manual will have that kind of information. Um, so you'd be looking for the type of hookup, right? So um, the connection that the implement has to whatever you'd be hooking it up to, You'd be looking for horsepower information, um, the weight of it, um, that kind of thing would be indicative, help you um, know what you're going to need to pull it. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that about renting equipment. So you mean just from like a local equipment dealer, like Central Equipment in Central Kentucky, or mm -hmm. perhaps Home Depot or Lowe's in your area, or Tractor. I don't know if Tractor Supply rents equipment, but a place like that that maybe yes. would have something that was a little heavier duty that could be used for um, some actual productive mm -hmm. scale usage. Yes, yes, um, you can rent, um, you know, those little BCS walk behind tillers. I know a lot of, you know, home gardeners that do that when they're getting started. So um, they're pretty accessible. Um, there is that option. Um, also rent, you know, uh, used equipment is also an option. So don't- That was my next something question. New. Yeah. Um, so advice if someone is looking at, you know, Craigslist or, you know, somewhere online or, or a posting they see at their local Southern states, what advice do you have of someone that wants to purchase some kind of used equipment? Well, um, I'm not a mechanic. <laughs> And my car is a 2003 vehicle. So um, I haven't had to buy a vehicle in a very long time, but some things to keep in mind, right? So go over there, you know, do not be bashful about asking questions. Um, have the person show you how to operate the piece of equipment, right? If they're selling it to you, then they should be able to operate it, right? Um, have them make sure it starts and it runs and you can, you know, test drive it, right? Um, check, turn it over. Um, you know, usually if it's a, a, anything of any, you know, if you're going to be spending a decent amount of money on this, um, the person may be able to let you take it to a mechanic to have it looked at, right? So for example, um, I believe it's called Earthworks in Owen County. They do repairs. I think they also sell BCS um, implements, um, those little walk-behinds. 
And so, you know, taking it to some place like that and having it checked out and like, hey, what is, is this in good condition? Is there anything that needs to be replaced? You know, that kind of thing is really, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be bashful. If you're gonna be spending any amount of money on it, don't be afraid to ask questions and ask to have something looked at, you know, get a second opinion, bring, you know, bring your friend with you who knows about, um, you know, who's mechanical, right? Um, those kind of things would be, would be what I would do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then of course, people would need to think about having a trailer that was appropriate to be able to move that kind of equipment, that that would be something you may be able to put it in the back of a truck, but you may have to have a trailer and there may be some things around. That. Right. And at the very least a ramp of some sort um, for the, even for a BCS that fits easily in the back of a truck, you still got to get it up into the truck. And so mm -hmm. unless you've got another person with you, you're going to need a ramp. And so thinking about um, that kind of thing, come, come with that stuff ready to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I was checking our time here at, and I don't know if we've had some more things pop up there in the chat, but will you be able to stick around um, for the rest of the evening in case people have questions and want to drop it in there? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Well, this was fantastic. I'm very interested in that little tilter. Um, i googled it while we were sitting here and unfortunately johnny's out of stock of those and, oh, the, no. price point, and the price point did um it's a little high little, yeah i might have to wait for christmas or a birthday or something to to ask yes. for that it's a little little bit pricey well, but that's a very interesting piece of a equipment. lot of this stuff though you know if you have someone mechanical in your life like that is not a very complicated piece of equipment right yeah. we have a drill so yeah. yeah, you have a drill. Yeah. Everybody has a drill at home, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things like, especially on Johnny's that I see that I'm like, I think somebody, you could probably rig something up like that. If you were creative and you had some maybe welding experience and woodworking experience, you could do it. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Well, I learned a ton and I appreciate you um, you're making this very basic because a lot of those things, maybe we don't think about, you know, dedicated um, measuring devices, you know, just for small scale use and some of these other pieces. And like, just thinking about the quality of your hand tools, that it's better to get a really good trowel than breaking one in the middle of planting and then having to either make do or go buy a new one. Like just make that investment into those pieces that you're going to have for a long time. Uh, I think yeah. Don't, yeah. Advice. Don't buy your trowel at the dollar store, right? Like go get it, get a good one. Yeah. Right. And the same thing goes with hose, you know, those connection points where the, the blade and the handle meet, that is where things break. So make sure you get a good one and it's a pain when they break. Right. Yeah for sure and that's not something you can fix very easily that's not something you can just run back to the garage and 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 fix so yeah no it's worth the worth a little bit of extra money yeah for sure all right awesome well thank you so much I want to move on then to Sean talking about the backpack sprayer um I'm gonna go ahead and launch this for you Cindy I already have it up I don't know if you noticed that. Okay. Yep. Go ahead and hit play if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. This is a type of equipment that your home gardeners or and specifically your market gardeners will want to be using if uh, they need to apply fungicides or insecticides or herbicides. A uh, backpack sprayer, whether it's a solo type hand pump backpack sprayer or a uh, CO2 sprayer. This is a solo backpack type sprayer. There are other manufacturers out there. This model specifically, um, you can see it comes with a wand on it. The only difference that we have is we have installed a quick connect coupling. This specifically is a piston type sprayer. There are also diaphragm type sprayers. A piston type sprayer will generate higher uh, pressure per square inch. It's used for low viscosity compounds, non-abrasive compounds, uh, things like herbicides and that. Uh, you would not use it for 
high viscosity compounds. Uh, the piston moves up and down to generate pressure. So uh, abrasive compounds like wettable powders and that you can't use in that. Uh, would recommend a diaphragm sprayer. What we did with our backpack sprayer is we installed a quick connect coupling uh, in the hose that comes with the sprayer. That allows us to attach other types of wands to the backpack sprayer. Uh, there are companies like R&D sprayers that sell different things. Uh, this would be used as a shielded sprayer to apply herbicides around plants. Uh, you can protect them that way with the shield, keep them from being uh, sprayed by the herbicides. Uh, CO2 sprayer is more for a larger scale market gardener. If you have half acre larger or something like that, it's probably what you're going to want to be using uh, if you're going to be applying a lot of uh, chemicals and things. Uh, the CO2 sprayers, you can set that so that the pressure is maintained at an even pressure, uh, work very well. Um, more costly, of course, than a solo sprayer, but it has a CO2 tank, uh, different size stainless steel tanks. Uh, the pressure is regulated. Uh, most solo type sprayers do have a pressure regulator inside the pressure is pumped up with the wand. Um, the model that we have here does not have the pressure regulator inside to adjust the pressure, uh, but the more professional models of the solo backpack sprayers and other sprayers do have that uh, pressure regulator inside. Uh, it's not quite as accurate as with a CO2 sprayer, uh, but the cost is substantially lower for something like a solo backpack sprayer as opposed to a CO2 sprayer. Uh, a four boom nozzle is real nice. Um, you can use that when you're applying herbicides, cover a lot more ground a lot more quickly than with just a single nozzle that your standard backpack sprayer comes with. Uh, really important with the larger scale gardeners because you have limited time and everything. It would certainly uh, look at your different options. Uh, either one of those works out very well. Uh, this is a two boom nozzle on here, uh, has a trigger guard, uh, easily attaches with that quick connect coupling. Uh, you can attach different types of nozzles on that, uh, flat fans, uh, even flat fans. You can use them for applying insecticides and fungicides, herbicides and things, um, but a little bit uh, more accurate than certainly your standard sprayer nozzle that comes with the solar sprayer, uh, get a much more even distribution of your pesticides, which is important. Um, as you're applying your pesticides to your solo backpack sprayer, uh, you kind of want to watch, make sure that this piston model is easily uh, repairable uh, compared to the diaphragm type model. Uh, but a diaphragm model you would use more for the application of fungicides, the uh, chemicals don't directly impact the diaphragm like they do in a piston system, um, higher viscosity things. Uh, the drawback with the diaphragm type system is it doesn't generate as high of a pressure as the piston system. It's also a little bit more complex to repair. If you're Either any of those will work well. If you're going to be applying fungicides and insecticides, oh, an even better option is something like the steel backpack mist blower. It's basically a leaf blower with an orifice on the end that uh, generates a fine mist, gives you the excellent coverage that you need for applying insecticides and fungicides. When you're applying that, coverage is critical. When you're applying herbicides, uh, you still need to get good coverage, but you're not looking for that canopy penetration of the pesticides like you are with an insecticide or a fungicide. So uh, for application of insecticides and fungicides, I would really recommend something like this steel backpack sprayer that come with different size tanks on them. Uh, do remember that eight gallons of water uh, or a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So uh, the larger the tank on the back, the more it's going to weigh. But that's certainly uh, comfortable. That's what we use for spraying in our uh, high tunnels. We can use it for spraying in a small field. You know, if you had a half acre of cucurbits, uh, you could certainly use that for getting good fungicide or insecticide applications on your cucurbits. Um, so 
just different types of products that are available out there. Uh, it's important that you adjust the straps and everything so that it fits comfortably. Uh, again, you always need to be wearing your proper protective equipment with applications on any of those products. But uh, whether you use a solo type backpack sprayer or a CO2 sprayer or a mist sprayer, any of those types of products I think will work very well for your needs. Uh, it's also important uh, with a solo type backpack sprayer uh, that you have two different types of or two different sprayers, one for applications of herbicides and one for application of insecticides and fungicides. All right, fantastic. Well, I should have introduced Sean a little bit more in depth. Um, Sean is Rachel's counterpart in Eastern Kentucky, has uh, experience in vegetable production as well. So for those of you that are in that part of the state, um, you know, feel free to contact either Rachel or Sean, uh, you know, with your uh, commercial vegetable questions uh, that you have. So uh, I apologize for that, not, not introducing him up just a little bit more. Um, so I want to move on to our next uh, item on here. We are running just maybe a little bit over on time, but we want to take just a little quick stretch break. So maybe Mackenzie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Cindy. So if you guys have been watching the past couple nights, you know that we do a little stretch break halfway through um, just to do some stretches. And, you know, we're all looking at a screen for the past hour. So it's always good to stretch your body. So today I'm going to teach you two more stretches. We've kind of been doing two different stretches a day. If you need to run to the bathroom or get something to drink, feel free to do that. So the first one is a tricep stretch. So you're going to take um, one arm and stick it straight up and then flip over your wrist. So your hand is pointed the opposite direction and basically pull your hand back towards your back. So your elbow is pointed straight up. And then you're going to take your other arm and place it over onto your elbow behind your head. And to intensify the stretch, you can push your head towards the back of, um, towards this arm. And that will kind of pull that tricep right here. And you'll probably also feel it in your shoulder blades. Then you can do the opposite one. So again, you know, flip your arm um, backwards and then Place your hand on your shoulder with your elbow up and place the opposite hand on your elbow and pull back. So push your head back towards the back wall behind you. And that should feel really good. And then our next one, um, you're gonna have both of your hands up above your head as well. Interlace your fingers like this and flip up your palms towards the ceiling. And you're just gonna stretch your palms towards the ceiling and then relax it and pull your shoulders down. And then stretch your palms towards the ceiling and pull your shoulders down. So that's all I have. I um, wanted to make that really quick since I know we're a little bit behind. But stretching is really great, especially when you're sitting at a table or a desk all day. So just remember to stretch so that you feel good and um, mentally and physically. Thanks, Mackenzie. That did feel really good. I was following along and doing my stretches too, and I need to remember to do that more frequently. Um, well, I want to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, you know, we've saw a little bit about those backpack sprayers and some of the different options. And our next speaker is all things pesticide. He's the go-to guy. Um, so I want to introduce Dr. Rick Besson. He's with the University of Kentucky as well. He's an extension entomologist. So like Rachel works with vegetables, he works with bugs. So um, please, Dr. Besson, tell us what we need to know about, you know, beginning to understand pesticides, what we need to do, how we use them, all of that information in the next, you know, 35, 40, 45 minutes. Okay. So it, that, that, that's a, uh, I hope you can hear me all right. I hope you can see my screen. 
Um, yes. that, that's a, a large uh, uh, shoe to fill, uh, covering everything with pesticides, but I'm going to do my best. And so I'm really gearing this towards people that are new to pesticides, new to farming. So this is literally introduction to pesticides and introduction to pesticide safety, particularly for those that are a little apprehensive about use, using pesticides. So uh, let me go ahead and get started. So, you know, some keys to effective pesticide use. First is you have to know what your target is. Uh, you should be able to identify your weeds, at least identify your weeds to, to uh, broad categories, uh, be able to get your diseases identified. And you know, if you can't identify them, we have resources, your county extension office, the plant disease diagnostic clinics, they're free in Kentucky, so take advantage of them. And the same with insects, you need to identify them because you know, certain herbicides target certain weeds, certain fungicides target certain diseases, and the same with insects. So you, you need to know this so you can match those up correctly. Now I make um, pesticide recommendations all the time. And when I make a pesticide recommendation, uh, you know, hopefully people are gonna get good control, but it depends on some things. You have to apply the correct product for the problem. If you're not applying the correct product, you're not gonna get control. Every pesticide has to be applied at the right time. You know, with weeds, uh, it's used when the, the herb, when the, uh, with the herbicides, it's used when the weeds are at a certain stage. Uh, generally, fungicides are used preventively. Uh, insecticides, uh, some of them are used preventatively. Others react to insect pressure. You wait until the insects get at a certain level, and then you can control them. But they have to go on at the right time when the problems are at a certain stage. You have to get good coverage. I mean, just because you put a pesticide out there at the right time doesn't mean you're going to get good control. You have to get good, thorough coverage, uh, uniform coverage, and you have to apply it at the right rate. And so Dr. Rudolph was showing all those uh, uh, good, good tools to, to measure pesticides. It's very important that you measure them correctly, and then you get them out there at the right rate throughout the field. You know, if you're doing all that, uh, we would assume the pesticides are going to work well. So, you know, in terms of recognizing some things uh, out there, we do have a, a number of full color guides. These are our best uh, uh, figures of diseases and insects and weeds and, and other problems you have. And you can see the number of crops that we have these available for. These are available from your county extension office. They're free of charge. Uh, I encourage you to go there and uh, ask your agent uh, to get copies of these because these are great. Get two copies, you know, put one in your truck, put, leave one in your house. Uh, th these are to help you identify problems. I'm a strong believer that if you don't identify your problem correctly, you're not going to manage it well. So uh, early good identification is so important. Now I'm going to talk about pesticides, but keep in mind, I don't think pesticides are necessarily the first step to control your problems. A lot of times they're the last step. We have to be using good farming practices. And so I have some of them listed here, you know, crop rotation, you know, sanitation ab after harvest, site selection, varietal selection, planting date, uh, you know, exclusion. Uh, there's a lot of different things you use. These are used preventively before you have the problem. But this is the basis that, that we start our production systems on. Doesn't matter if you have a small garden in the backyard or if you have 10 acres. The, these are the, the best management practices, the good farming practices that you need to be using. So pesticide regulations. Pesticides are very much regulated uh, in, in Kentucky and in the United States. Uh, they're regulated by the EPA. Uh, there, there's a law called FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Uh, the, uh, the, the federal government takes that very seriously. I've done some lectures in prisons, and I've seen some people in prisons that have violated FIFRA, and that's why they're there. Um, that's, those are extreme violations. But here in Kentucky, the arm of the EPA is the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. And so they're here to help you. They're also here to regulate and make sure that we do things right. Now, one of the big uh, designations with pesticides are restricted use versus general use pesticides. 
general use pesticides are available to anyone in Kentucky, basically over 18. You don't need any special training. Uh, the, the, there's a wide enough margin of safety that they think the general public uh, should have access to, to, to this group of pesticides. But then there's the restricted use pesticides. And those are ones where there are some hazards. And because of that, uh, training is required. And so you have to become a certified applicator uh, to purchase or use restricted use pesticides. There's two categories of uh, certified applicators. There are private applicators. These are people that apply pesticides on their own land or that of their employer uh, for agricultural purposes. Uh, these people, uh, to get certified, they get trained at their local county extension office. Uh, training takes about three hours and the certification lasts for three years. After three years, they need to do it again. Commercial applicators are, are really the people that are uh, pesticide applicators for hire. Uh, they, they run businesses, you know, they work for the, the uh, local governments. I'm a, a commercial applicator uh, because I train people. Uh, for, for these applicators, they have to uh, study. There's online training materials, and then they take a test by the KDA, and they have to do that. Once they uh, are certified, then they have to uh, maintain their, their certification by so many continuing education units every three years. They have to uh, complete uh, 12 hours of continuing education every three years. And I have a, a, a picture there just showing the website uh, wh where those training materials are. So, you know, and when, it, when it comes into the pes pesticides, pesticides are in all sorts of different forms that, that are sold. We call these formulations. Uh, you know, uh, one of the formulations are granules, uh, and, and they look like kitty litter and when you put them out, maybe a little bit heavier than, than kitty litter. And these are often used for soil applications. They, they can be banded, they, they can be broadcast and incorporated into the soil, but generally uh, granules are for soil application. Then these other formulations, you're going to see uh, things like water dispersible granules. They look like the granules, but when you put them in water, they dissolve readily. Uh, you agitate them a little bit, and within a few minutes, generally, they, they dissolve. Emulsifiable concentrate, th those are uh, or generally in organic or petroleum-based uh, uh, solvents, and they mix with water to make an emulsion. Uh, soluble concentrates, uh, flowables, uh, which are finely ground materials that they almost look like uh, a milkshake, uh, a melted milkshake uh, uh, when they come out of the uh, bottle. Uh, Microencapsulated, uh, these are ones that have extended residual activity. And then there are some liquids out there, things that uh, just normally dissolve in water and are liquids. This other group, they, they can be broadcast over the soil like the, like the granules, or they can be applied foliarly to plants. And so that, those are their, their general uses. When you look at the pesticide label, like that sale label right there, you see that formulation is usually right after the name of the product. So a sale, um, it, it says, uh, I, I thought it, I, it said 30, uh, gee, I, I couldn't see it on my screen, but uh, th that indicated it's a 30% product uh, in that uh, soluble granule, the SG. So application methods, when it comes to applying pesticides, we apply them in a number of different ways in the field. So we can uh, broadcast them. That's often used with herbicides. Uh, for example, uh, that, that sprayer in that picture that they're broadcasting uh, that, that pesticide with a, uh, a boom type sprayer. So it has a long boom, cover a lot of ground very quickly with that. Uh, we can broadcast it over the soil and work it into the soil. We often call that pre-plant incorporated. So you spray it and you work it into the ground, you know, anywhere from two to uh, four or five inches uh, to get into the soil. Uh, chemigation, you're gonna see that on some pesticide labels. That's where we mix the product into irrigation water. And there's some products we can put out in trickle irrigation, others into overhead irrigation, but that, that's all called chemigation. Many products uh, are prohibited from being put out that way. So you have to read the label very carefully to see uh, what methods of application are permitted. Foliar applications, 
So that's this is where we're uh, uh, treating the plants uh, and getting it uh, hopefully on uh, the leaf or on both sides of the leaf. Uh, a drench, so that's a, applied directly around the base of the plant uh, or banded applications. So we can put that as a narrow band uh, in the soil. Uh, we can put a band on the, on the side of the uh, row and incorporate that in, but it's usually just a narrow band, generally anywhere from uh, four to seven inches wide is how, how we apply that, that band. And that could be with granular materials, that could be with uh, uh, liquid sprays as well. We also have pesticide adjuvants that we uh, can use. And what adjuvants do, these are other additives, they're not pesticides themselves, they're not killing anything, they're just improving qualities of the spray. And uh, you need to read the labels of the pesticides you're using very carefully to see what types of adjuvants uh, they recommend. And, and some pesticides, they, they'll require you use an adjuvant. If you don't, the pesticide may not work. So it's important that you uh, follow that label guidance. But some of the things that uh, we use adjuvants for, one is for pH buffering. Uh, you know, most city water, I've had growers bring in city water and we've tested it, and it runs about 7.4 to 7.7 .7 pH. The ideal pH uh, for spray solutions is generally between 6 and 6.5. So we, you know, ideally, we'd need to make that uh, city water just a little bit more acid. And so we can do that with a pH buffer. So there's a number of adjuvants that will buffer the pH and get it, get it to... Uh, that area we want it to be, so the, so it doesn't the water doesn't break down the pesticide we're using. Uh, there's wetting agents, you know. There's some of the uh, uh, vegetables we grow, like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower, that you know when sprays hit the uh, leaves, they just beat up and they roll off. And so wetting agents help to to wet those waxy surfaces. We have spreaders to affect the surface tension of the water. Uh, stickers that are going to stick the pesticides on there and extend the residual activity on the plant. Uh, defoamers uh, for the tank, so you, you don't have a lot of foam there. We have penetrants. This helps a lot of the materials that you can spray on the plant that will uh, uh, be translaminar or penetrate into the leaf. So these penetrants help that out. Uh, we even have coloring agents. Coloring agents are good when you want to see where you've already sprayed. So you're not going to overlap and double apply a pesticide or potentially miss an area and have a, a, a skip. So uh, people will put in coloring agents so they can see where they have sprayed. Tom, common types of spreaders, I think Dr. Rudolph mentioned this, Dr. Wright mentioned this, but uh, so here, here's my take on that. But you know, uh, these are going to depend upon the size of your operation. Everything is scale dependent. So Anything from the, the, the small uh, uh, plot in the backyard to, you know, the, the back 40 over there. So, you know, if you have the back 40, uh, you may be thinking about using things like a big boom sprayer and, you know, cover a lot of ground fast and get a lot of material out, but it, it's a big ex expense. You're going to need a tractor. Uh, you're going to need uh, invest quite a bit in that sprayer. Uh, you know, down, down at the bottom, you can see some of the options, the backpack sprayer, uh, again, that's, that's for uh, small to moderate sized operations. You have to keep pumping that the whole time. You know, I've used, I've spent a lot of hours with a backpack on my back and it is good. You, you can do everything you can do with that boom sprayer it just takes more time and it takes more work. Uh, mist blower, those are great because you can get uh, really good coverage. You can blow that mist into things like tomatoes and peppers that have very dense foliage and you, you can get, get very good coverage that way. Uh, one thing I've seen in the last year or so, a lot of people uh, applying for uh, making drone applications. Uh, so that, that's a new thing that's coming up. It's very good for small, hard to reach areas. Uh, they're, they're thinking of these along power line uh, right of ways and, and things like that, but even small scale growers are, are considering that. Uh, my recommendation would be maybe just to wait a little while and see how this works out for them. Some of the data I've seen on coverage uh, has not been uh, stellar with this, uh, but, but there are people that have interest in that right now. And then we have air blast sprayers. You know, for people that are, uh, have orchard crops or vineyards, uh, the air blast is often uh, the way that they're uh, gonna apply pesticides there. So there's a number of different ways we can apply these. 
There's a number of different nozzles as well. Uh, Dr. Wright mentioned the flat fan nozzle. Um, th this sort of spray sprays, your spray comes out in a two dimensional pattern. Uh, this is the uh, uh, choice for putting out herbicides. Generally with herbicides, it's like painting the soil. And you so see you want something that's just gonna put a nice uniform coat on a flat surface, which is the soil. And the flat fan works very well. We often use these at low pressures. Uh, you know, 30 PSI is very common, up to 40 PSI, but I've seen people go as high as 50, but it's, it's generally the low end of the pressure scale there. Now with the insecticides and fungicides, we're, we're often trying to uh, do a foliar application where we penetrate into the leaves, get it, get it around on the backside of the leaf. Flat fans, not gonna work. So what we use are, are cone fans. As we, as we go over the, the crop, uh, we hit it from one direction on one edge of the cone, and we hit it from another direction on the other side of the cone. And so the hollow cone or the solo co solid cone uh, tend to be the uh, nozzles we use. We use higher pressure too. So with insecticides, uh, really 40 to 60, I would say is the, the common area, but I've seen people get as high as 100 PSI. With fungicides, again, uh, a bit higher, and it's because they need to get that thorough coverage. Uh, the denser the plant, the bigger the plant, the higher the pressure you need. So if it's a smaller plant, you know, even with a fungicide, you might be able to get by with, you know, 40 PSI. But when you get into tomatoes and other plants, uh, that's where you're looking at the, the higher pressure. But, you know, we also want to put uh, strainers, uh, if you've ever used a sprayer and you've not had a, a strainer, uh, you've probably experienced plugged nozzles. And so we put these little strainers in there right before the nozzle, keeps the nozzle free of debris so it sprays uniformly. Uh, so the little things like that, uh, very cheap, but they can save a lot of frustration in the field. Uh, pesticide modes of action. Uh, th this has become uh, much more important in the past few years because of uh, weeds, insects, and diseases developing resistance to pesticides. And so what we do is we classify uh, all of our pesticides into what we call mode of action groups, how they, they kill uh, the target organism. And so for insecticides, we have something called the Insecticide Res uh, Resistance Action Committee, IRAC, and they have uh, broken the insecticides down into those different mode of action categories I have listed there on the right. And so uh, each of those represents a different way of killing an insect with an insecticide. Uh, there's something similar for fungicides, we call that the FRAC groupings, and the for herbicides, the HRAC groupings. Uh, and the idea is uh, we know when we switch different modes of action groups, we're rotating how we control these pests, and we're helping to prevent resistance. And so what we do is when we look at a pesticide label like this Malathion 1% granular, up the top, you see that little box, it's pretty small, so I enlarged it down on the bottom left, and it says it's a group 1B insecticide. And so we know that uh, uh, that's the group it belongs to. If, if with the next generation, the next time we spray that pest, we wanna to go to a different group like we should, we just have to find something that, that works for that pest, but is not a 1B insecticide. And we know we're, we're rotating our products uh, uh, appropriately then. So just some of the groups, and I thought I'd just go over a few of these for you. Uh, the first one here is the pyrethrins. This is a very, very common group. Uh, it was developed in uh, this group in 1949. They uh, kill insects the same way DDT killed insects, but uh, they're not DDT. Uh, they have the same mode of action. Uh, they act as nerve poisons. Uh, they really didn't come on the market till the 70s, though. And you can see some of the, the groups they control. So they're very good at controlling uh, beetles, uh, bugs, caterpillars, grasshoppers. These are very diverse groups of insects. So we call this a broad spectrum group of insecticides. They're not very selective. Uh, they can be hard on pollinators too. Uh, there are some health concerns when you use these. Some people have skin sensitivity. 
I happen to be one of those that does have skin sensitivity. So when I put on my personal protective equipment, everywhere where there's a, a slight crack that shows my skin, I can tell that I use that pesticide. It, it has sort of a burning sensation that, that lasts for about a half a day. Uh, so some people have that, other people don't. Uh, if you do have it, uh, vitamin E creams uh, alleviates that a lot. Uh, these are not systemic. Uh, they're just used for foliar applications. They do not penetrate the leaf. Uh, stickers uh, help very, very much with these. The cost is very low. Uh, that's why they're used so widely because they can just be a few dollars per acre. Many of them are off patent, which means that generics are available. Generic products uh, tend to be cheaper. Uh, they give good residual activity. It's usually one to two weeks and probably leaning more towards the two weeks than the one week in terms of residual activity. In terms of predator mite toxicity, predator mites help to eat other insects, so we try and preserve them. Unfortunately, uh, pyrethroids, pyrethroids are highly toxic to the predator mites. In terms of pollinators, this group is also highly toxic to pollinators. In terms of environmental concerns, uh, they are also uh, toxic to aquatic organisms and fish. So you have to be very careful about using these around creeks and other places where you're gonna get uh, uh, residues that, that, that wash into streams and ponds. Uh, and the one other comment I have is the, these tend to be more effective at lower temperatures and less effective at higher temperatures. Next group is one of the most common, it, it is the most common group of insecticides used in the world right now. These are the neonicotinoids. You hear about these in, in the media an awful lot. We just have a few products there. Uh, imidacloprid is the most widely used insecticide in the world. Uh, they were developed in the 80s and they came on the market in the 90s. Uh, they act as nerve poisons, very similar to nicotine. And so in terms of uh, what, what they control, it varies by product. Uh, they tend to be very effective against a number of sucking insects, but some of them will also get uh, some of the beetles and, and some worms. It, it really depends upon the product. Uh, in terms of health concerns, uh, not a lot of health concerns. That's one reason why the, this group came on the market so fast is a lot of uh, safety with uh, ma uh, mammalian systems. Uh, they can cause some eye irritation and they can be harmful if swallowed. Uh, a number of these are systemic, and so there, there can be, uh, with some products, very good systemic activity. Uh, they're inexpensive. Uh, some are off patent, and so the generics are available. Uh, residual activity uh, with the foliar applications, it's five to, to seven days, typically. Uh, systemic activity can be uh, three or more weeks, so very good systemic uh, uh, residual activity. In terms of predator mites, moderately toxic, uh, pollinator toxicity, this is what you hear in the news. They're, they are very, very toxic uh, to, to uh, bee pollinators. And so that's one of the concerns with them. Uh, in terms of uh, environmental concerns, uh, they're uh, toxic to some aquatic organisms. Uh, and uh, there is some resistance in a number of, of pest groups. Uh, the last group I'm going to talk about is just the BTs. And so uh, the, these are, most of these are organically approved. Uh, they're very effective against uh, generally uh, caterpillars. They act as stomach poisons. And what they do is they're actually proteins. And when they get eaten by insects, they have to be eaten. Uh, they actually make holes in the stomach. And the insect dies from infection, from septicemia. The gut bacteria get in the blood system and they just die of an infection because of the holes in their stomach. And so it, it's really a, a, a neat way that uh, it controls insects. So uh, there, there's uh, the BTs, they're specific to uh, certain caterpillars. And there's one group, one type of BT that attacks beetle larvae or a few beetle larvae. Um, in terms of health concerns, uh, there really are no health statements. Uh, there is some eye and respiratory irritation that, that's possible, uh, but, but it's, uh, uh, the, the health concerns on the safety data sheets are uh, very minimal. Uh, systemic uses, no, uh, they're only used for foliar applications. Uh, cost, they're, they're generally inexpensive uh, compared to uh, modern uh, pesticides that are being labeled now. So. Uh, they're, they're not that expensive. Uh, residual activity, 
uh, we're looking up to about five days. I wouldn't expect uh, residual activity past about five days. Predator mite toxicity, uh, it's the lowest uh, level. So it's low toxicity, uh, low toxicity to pollinators, uh, environmental concerns, uh, negligible uh, with this product. Uh, and my comment would be that these are compatible with most biological control programs, and many are OMRI approved for organic production. And oh, I, I, I guess I, I didn't tell the truth. I had one more group. And these are the diamides. This is a, a new group. Uh, it's a synthetic group. It was developed in the 90s, and it's, it's been in the marketplace uh, I think for about uh, uh, 15 years or so. And th these work on a, a, a nerve receptor in uh, insect muscles. And uh, it's, a, it's a novel mode of action. Uh, it can be very, these groups are, are uh, these insecticides are very effective. Uh, the groups controlled include a number of uh, caterpillars, uh, a number of uh, beetle larvae, uh, thrips. Uh, so a, a wide variety of insects that, that can be controlled. Uh, health concerns vary by product, uh, some skin and eye sen uh, sensitivity with it. Uh, systemic uses are possible with some products that they, they can be systemic. Uh, there's one that can give uh, upwards of 30 days of uh, insect control. Uh, moderately expensive, uh, very good residual activity, uh, seven days for foliar, uh, three or more weeks with systemic uh, low toxicity. Uh, predator toxicity varies by product. Uh, some of the products are very low, others are moderately toxic. Uh, some toxicity to aquatic organisms, and that varies by product. Uh, again, these are very compatible with biological control programs, uh, but resistance is beginning to appear with uh, some pests, and, and these are generally very safe for mammals and birds. So one thing I, I like to look at, I'm switching over to pesticide safety uh, quickly here. But pesticides in the news, uh, this is a study that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, it looked at 8,000 pesticide users uh, in Japan over 34 years. The study was conducted on Japanese men. Uh, what they found is that when they had people that had been using pesticides for a long time and they categorized their exposure as low, moderate, or high, the people that said they only had lower, moderate exposure had no health effects. But the people that categorized their exposure as high had 45% higher heart attack rates. And what that tells me is we wanna make sure we don't get high exposure to pesticides. Keep your exposures low. It has good health consequences for you. Uh, in terms of uh, safety, when you think about pesticides relative to other products that you're exposed to, so uh, pesticides versus home chemicals, uh, this list, I know it's very small and hard to read, but the blue bars are insecticides, the green bars are fungicides and herbicides, the red bars are other things you find in the home uh, environment. The smaller the bar, the more dangerous the chemical is, the more toxic it is. The bigger the bar means the more margin of safety that you have. And what's surprising is you see some things that you find in the home all, all the time that are right there with some of the insecticides. And so things like Motrin, and aspirin and Tylenol, even white vinegar has toxicity. And you might think, well, you know, I, I took two Motrin yesterday and I'm feeling fine. Keep in mind what we're talking about is the pure active ingredient. So this is not the formulated tablet you eat, but just the pure active ingredient. But we're also talking about the pure active ingredient with the pesticides as well. And so some of the pesticides have toxicities that are similar to some of the products in your house right now. There are different routes of exposure. Keep in mind eyes, nose, mouth, and skin. The uh, place you're most likely to get exposure is your skin, your, your hands and arms and face and, and things like that. So, you know, when you're going out and, and you're spraying your tomatoes in your high tunnel and you look like this, uh, just keep in mind, you're really hitting all the buttons when it comes to pesticide exposure. I don't know what he's spraying, but I, I hope it's something that's low toxicity because uh, not, not doing a lot to uh, reduce his exposure. In terms of symptoms of pesticide poisoning, there's no one symptom. It depends upon the product you're using. It depends upon the person and how they react to it. 
Many of these symptoms are easily confused with COVID or allergies or the flu or the cold. And so you have to be careful. If you've been spraying something and you know with, within a few hours of spraying that you, you come down with something, you, you probably want to have a health professional check you out. You know, and uh, uh, be ready to tell them what you were spraying. Bring them a copy of the label. Even bring them a, a, the container inside a plastic bag if you have to. Uh, if you want to know more about your pesticides, look up the SDS sheets. I do that. When I use products that are new, I'll check the SDX, SDS sheets, safety data sheets. And I usually look in section two because that's the hazard identification section. And that will talk about specific hazards to the person. For example, a product that I was using, I learned that it causes permanent eye damage. Uh, that really scares the heck out of me. So I make sure that I wear goggles uh, when, when, when I'm using that product. And so, um, you know, when it comes to pesticide toxicity, uh, the faster the poison is washed off of you, the less injury. And so when you have pesticide spills on the skin, uh, you know, you, you need to react quickly. You need to rinse that area with plenty of clean water. So how do you prepare for that? Well, when you're going out in the spring, make sure you have a source of clean water, at least five gallons per person uh, that, that's out there spraying. You know, remove contaminated clothing. I always bring an extra Tyvek shoot, suit. I've had the hose come off of a backpack sprayer with me and I've got soaked with chemical. You know, I, I, I rinsed myself and I, I got into a clean Tyvek suit. Uh, you know, have, have single-use paper towels, uh, wrap, wrap the person uh, in, in a uh, blanket to keep them warm. With eye exposure, uh, you know, you get, you get some blowback when you're spraying, gets in your eyes, uh, you need to flush your eyes. The, the rule of thumb is you need to flush them continuously for 15 minutes uh, with clean water or eye wash solution. So I usually bring two quarts of eye wash solution when I'm away from uh, clean water when I'm spraying. After, after you uh, do that, you still need to get medical attention. You know, for inhaled pesticides, be careful. Uh, you don't wanna go help someone where, where they've just inhaled pesticides and go into a high tunnel or a greenhouse because you're gonna expose yourself. So you need to approach the victim wearing a respirator uh, the best thing to do is move the victim to fresh air immediately. Loosen tight clothing, uh, be, be prepared with artificial respiration if needed, uh, protect them from falling, and then seek medical attention. So, you know, swallowed pesticides. If this happens, particularly, you know, if it's a, a person that doesn't know about pesticides, uh, they, they swallow something, uh, you need to read the label quickly. See if you're supposed to cause vomiting or not. Uh, it, never induce uh, vomiting if the person's unconscious. Uh, never induce vomiting if it's a corrosive uh, pesticide. These are generally diluted with milk or water. And again, uh, seek medical attention. This is my first aid kit that I keep when, I, when I'm uh, going out in spring. I have gloves. Uh, I, I have a Tyvek suit, not a coverall. Uh, emergency blanket, several bottles of clean water for rinsing, not for drinking activated charcoal, a can of evaporated milk, two bottles of eye wash, a gallon sealable bag, uh, single use paper towel, simple bandages, and a, a bottle of dish soap. And so that's what I call my go kit uh, when I'm going out and spraying. Keep in mind, uh, risk with pesticides is a combination of exposure and toxicity. So when you're working with concentrates, that's higher, uh, it, it, toxicity just because you're working with the active ingredient. So you need to make absolutely sure you're not getting spills and splashes and drops on you uh, with these concentrates. A little bit is a high exposure. Uh, some products are low in toxicity, others in, are in high in toxicity. So it's a combination of exposure and toxicity. But even after it's mixed up and you're out in the field spraying, it's dilute, but you're going to be exposed to it over a much longer period of time. And so you can still have problems with exposure out in the field. Uh, and then other things happen. You, you rupture containers, you know, container spills, things like that. So be prepared for those situations. Know how to deal with it before it happens. So which is have, uh, healthier? 
You got the guy over there spraying his tomatoes, no PPE, and the other person spraying his peppers and, and is suited up, uh, probably get, getting close to looking like an astronaut over there. Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, you need to read the label. You know, the, if, if the label doesn't require any personal protective equipment, maybe the guy on the left was, was all right. Uh, if it required a lot, maybe the guy on the right uh, was okay. But, you know, the more personal protective equipment uh, that you put on, uh, it can cause some health uh, issues with you. You know, when you're wearing a 40 pound uh, backpack and you're spraying for most of the day, walking up and down rows and you're in a Tyvek suit with goggles and a respirator and gloves, uh, you can have medical conditions associated with that. So read the label, see what is required. And that is what I recommend using everything that's required on the label under the personal protective equipment. Now, this is my recommendation. If, if it doesn't have anything that's required, uh, the, the Rick Besson recommendation is shoes and socks, uh, long pants, long sleeve shirt, and gloves. And so that's my absolute minimum when nothing is required. Be able to uh, read a pesticide label. This is the general outline of a pesticide label. So some of the things, you know, the product name, whether it's restricted use, if it's restricted use, it's gonna be right there at the top of that, that front uh, page of the label. Right underneath that's the product name, it's gonna have the active ingredients. Uh, you know, it's gonna have the signal word, whether it's danger, poison, danger, warning, or caution. Caution would be the lowest level of, uh, of a signal word. That's uh, uh, um, just low toxicity at that point. Warning would be moderately toxic, and obviously danger is highly toxic. Uh, it's going to have the first aid statement, so that that's at the beginning there. So that that's what the doctor needs to know if someone's been uh, exposed to the pesticide. But also uh, on the next page, you get into the precautionary statements, and I I get a lot of use out of reading those precautionary statements. Uh, where are the potential problems with this? And then finally, you get down to the directions for use. It shows the crops it's, it's registered on, the pests that it will control. Again, keep in mind, ESCO out at the right time, at the right coverage, at the right rate in order for all that to work. And the last part would be the storage and disposal. Uh, you know, uh, how you store it, how you dispose of it, uh, how you get rid of the container. That's all on the label. Label has a tremendous amount of information and it's all research-based. Uh, some pesticides require respirators. Uh, and uh, just keep in mind that uh, these are not the face masks we use for COVID. These, these are respirators. So you hear, you know, N95. N95 is one of the, uh, the lowest level uh, respirators that we can wear. It's for particles, and it only provides 95% uh, protection against some of the particles. We can get up to... Uh, uh, there's N100s, there, there's R100s, P100s. Uh, so read the label, see what's there. Uh, if a respirator is required, uh, then you must have a medical clearance. Your doctor has to say that you're fit enough to wear a respirator, wearing that, that Tyvek suit with that 40 pound backpack on your back. Uh, they wanna make sure you're, you're not gonna have a stroke or a heart attack when you're out there doing that because the respirator is gonna limit the oxygen that your body can get. The other thing you need to have if a respirator is required is an annual respirator fit test. And the fit is to see how well the respirator fits your face. Uh, there are different models and different sizes and there are tests that have to be done every year to make sure that it's, it's the right model and the right size for your face. And you know, here are some of the different types of respirators that are out there. So depending upon the label, it will indicate what what type of respirator you need, what it needs to protect you from, and then you go from there. Pesticide cleanup after you're done using pesticides, uh, you know, throw away any single use personal protective equipment. The reusable stuff, you need to wash it with soap and water, warm water and soap uh, and dry it and, and uh, put it up for use next time. Don't store it with your pesticides, but uh, store it in a separate location. After you're done washing your PPE, then, then you wash yourself. Uh, again, you get a new bucket of uh, soapy water uh, and you wash your hands, your face, your arms and that type of thing, and then you're good to go. 
uh, washing PPE, or I mean, wash, washing your clothes, I should say. Uh, you, you've been spraying pesticides that day, you're getting back to the house. First thing you need to do is take off your clothes, take a shower, uh, put your clothes into the washer, run them separately from your family's clothes. Uh, we found that the high efficiency washers are just as good at removing the uh, pesticides as the old washers. Uh, after you've washed your clothes, uh, run the washer once on the rinse cycle uh, with detergent. And that's going to help uh, clean, clean the washer. Then it's good for the rest of the family's clothes. Elements of pesticide storage. Always store pesticides in their original containers. Store pesticides in a locked building or cabinet. We want to keep children, pets, and other people that are uh, unaware of pesticides out of the pesticides. So locked in a, a separate building or cabinet, use signage to alert people. You know, this is my pesticide building. I have a sign on there that says danger pesticide storage. Keep it well lit and dry, keep it uncluttered. You need to have an impervious floor. Uh, I had a drain in my floor, so I sealed the drain. And make sure there's good ventilation. You don't wanna breathe those pesticides when you're in there. Have materials to manage spills and leaks. You know, I think of the three C's when it comes to a spill, control, contain, and cleanup. Control means you know, pesticide container falls over, you stand it up, you've controlled the spill. Contain would be now that you have that material on the, on the floor and it's spreading out, you need to contain it. You know, put, put some kitty litter or some, some uh, material around it that's gonna stop it from, from moving and it's gonna keep it contained at that one location. Once you've done those two, then you have time where you can think about how you're gonna clean it up. You know, you, do you have kitty litter? Uh, do you have sawdust? Uh, do you have floor sweep or something like that? You can absorb it and uh, clean up that area. So have those materials on hand. Uh, think about that before the leak occurs. And then, you know, how are you going to store them over the winter? Uh, look at that, that final section of the label. It's going to tell you about the storage conditions. Uh, pesticides are expensive. You just don't want to leave them anywhere. Uh, a lot of them, if they get too cold, they're, they're not going to be uh, useful anymore. They're, they're going to crystallize and now they become hazardous waste. So follow those storage conditions uh, carefully. Transporting pesticides, think about how you transport them. Uh, you wanna make sure when you transport them, they're not gonna fall around, slide around. You're not gonna put them in the trunk of your car next to your uh, kids' clothes or your groceries. Uh, so they should be secured. They should be uh, moved separately. Uh, they, they should not be able to uh, bounce around or tip over. Uh, you should store them away from temperature extremes and don't leave them unattended in the, the bed of your truck. Uh, that, that's not a good idea. Pesticide calibration. There's a couple of ways of uh, uh, calibrating your pesticides. Uh, the one way I, I particularly like is what we call the fixed area output method. Uh, and I'll just show that to you in a minute. The nozzle output method, I'm not going to go over that tonight, but I'm going to show you a publication where, where it explains that. So with the uh, fixed area application method, what you do is you fill up your sprayer all the way to the top, and then you measure out an area that needs to be sprayed. You pump up your sprayer and you, you make your application just like you're gonna do with your pesticide, but you're just using water. And then you bring it back and then you measure the amount of water it takes to refill that container. So you know the area you just treated, you know how much water it took to treat that area, now you, you know how much material you're putting out per fixed area. And it's very easy to calibrate your sprayer uh, with that. The nozzle output method, it, 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 it's a little bit more complicated, but it's particularly good for uh, multi-nozzle type sprayers. Uh, again, uh, we have that in our pesticide record keeping manual. It actually has some worksheets on, on how to do that. And I'm gonna leave it for that tonight. This is our uh, pesticide record keeping manual for private applicators. Uh, it, it has all those uh, tables and worksheets for cal calibrating sprayers, as well as tables for recording all the information you need to record with your pesticide applications. Some other things to think about, you know, particularly if you're spraying pesticides on small areas, are these are what I call some of the handy numbers. And I, I actually uh, keep these numbers in my head, uh, and it helps me calculate 
how much I need to put, how much pesticide I need to put out on small uh, acreage. You know, when, when I'm just treating something that's, you know, a 10th of an acre or a 20th of an acre. Uh, one of the numbers I, I know is that in an acre, there's 43,560 square feet, 128 fluid ounces in a gallon, you know, two tablespoons in an ounce, three teaspoons in a tablespoon. And a lot of times I'll, 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 I'll switch over to metrics and I know one teaspoon is five milliliters. Uh, you know, if I'm working with dry materials, uh, you know, 16 ounces in a pound and one ounce works out to about 30 grams. In terms of measuring stuff for very small plots, uh, I use just syringes. You know, it's not a syringe with a needle, it's just the plastic syringe. Those are very accurate. Uh, I've seen people use some of these tip balances uh, that they're very effective. And even some of these pocket scales can be good, particularly for, for dry materials. Uh, we do have a pollinator protection plan. Uh, it's very important that when we use pesticides, we're not gonna use them in a way that harms pollinator, pollinators. We depend upon pollinators for much of agriculture. Uh, the environment depends upon uh, pollinators. So uh, we do have that plan. I, I direct you to it. I can't go through that plan tonight, but I can say one thing, and that is do not spray pesticides toxic to pollinators on blooming crops or blooming weeds. I mean, that, that, if there's one take home message is don't spray pesticides toxic to pollinators on blooming crops or weeds. Uh, we also have worker protection standards that you need to abide by if you're using pesticides. So uh, worker protection standards require owners or employers on agricultural establishments uh, to protect their employees on farms, forests, nurseries, and greenhouses from exposure to agricultural pesticides. And some of the things you need to do for your workers, uh, you have to train them annually. You have to provide the personal protective equipment. You can't expect the, your employee to go out and purchase that. You need to communicate pesticide application information. If the, if the label says you have to notify workers orally, you have to do that. If you have to post your fields after you spray, you have to do that. You need to get medical attention for your exposed workers. So you're responsible for making sure they get medical attention if they've had a pesticide exposure. Have a central pesticide information center that lists the, the recent applications, your SDS sheets there, as well as that poster down in the bottom right corner. Uh, and comply with your personal protective equipment, your restricted entry intervals, and your application exclusion zones. Those are all things that are covered by the worker protection standards. Keep records. Uh, you need to keep, um, uh, record your pesticide applications. Uh, you need to keep records for three years in Kentucky. Records need to be made within 14 days of application. And the USDA, uh, EPA, or KDA have legal access to those records. And these are the types of things that you need to record. We do have that booklet that will help you uh, in terms of organizing uh, that information and making sure you get all the information uh, that you need to record. So that was a lot of information, Cindy. Uh, I went through it fairly quickly. You did, that was so great. Like every slide we need to have you do a presentation on just that information. Like that's so good. And I learned a lot. I mean, I thought I knew the basics, um, but I still picked up some really good information. So. So thank you so much. One question I have for you is, you mentioned municipal water. Um, do you have any recommendations for folks who maybe would want to use well water or surface water, or do you treat them all the same, just as long as you no, know the pH? That, that, that's a real good question. You know, you think city water is gonna be fairly uniform. It's gonna be the same, but it, it actually varies by time of the year. And I was surprised to see it fluctuated between 7.4 and 7.7. We had growers bring in well water and pond water and creek water. And what we found is it ranged anywhere from about 6.5 up to, I think it was like 9.7. And it was really, really uh, alkaline. And so that was really concerning. And that grower said, well, maybe that's one reason why my pesticides aren't working so well. And so, you know, it's just a matter of putting in a little bit of buffer solution when he uses that water. It's, you know, how, how do you condition the water properly 
So it's the right water that you need to be spraying with. And, and we do have those conditioners out there. So it's an easy fix. Okay, okay. And then one of the questions that came in on the chat was about disposal. Um, so frequently in counties, they'll have um, pesticide disposal days. Sometimes they have the recycling events through KDA. Um, what would you recommend for folks to find out information about that? Um, just call their county office, call KDA. You, you, you just answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it, and it, it's all run through the KDA. Mm -hmm. And so they, they have what they call their amnesty program for farmers. And so you can bring in pesticides. And I can tell you, they have brought in anything you can imagine has been brought in. Uh, we've had DDT brought in. Uh, we, we, we've had lead arsenic, you know, from, from the 30s that someone found, found in a barn. They brought that in. And, and the good thing is we're, we're getting this out and we're disposing of it properly. And that's what we want to do. We just want to, you know, keep, keep the, the ground and, and the, the, the uh, uh, water in Kentucky uh, clean and healthy. And so, yes, we, we have those amnesty programs. Okay, great. And then my last question, which segues to our final little um, clip, is about organic production. So we tend to think that, oh, it's organic, I don't have to worry about it. But what are your recommendations for people um, who maybe are certified organic? Um, do they need pesticide certification? Do they follow the same PPE requirements? Um, what advice do you have around that? Okay. Um, what one thing that uh, I, I think some people are mistaken if they think organic products are always safer than synthetic products. Because I, I can give you examples where the synthetic product's safer than the organic product. Um, so people, my recommendation is read the label. There's, there's some organic products that require a respirator. Why? Because you can have a lung allergy to some of the proteins in them. So uh, they require PPE. Uh, check to see what the pre-harvest interval is on those products. Uh, you know, you know if, if you're growing produce and you're selling that produce to customers, you should be a private applicator. It doesn't matter if you're organic or not. You need to know how to properly uh, calibrate your sprayer, put on the right dosage. You should understand uh, pre-harvest intervals, restricted entry intervals, ag exclusion zones, all those things that we go over with pesticide training, it applies to everyone. And I, th I think to say, well, what I'm using is so safe, I don't need to be trained, that, that's a bit cavalier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, I do want to get to our next clip. We're kind of at the end here, but we have um, Tony Silver now, um, and then we'll do a little quick debrief at the end of this. So that'll be a last minute chance to ask Dr. Besson or Dr. Rudolph some questions, but we'll go ahead and play this clip about organic certification, um, and then we'll come back for a quick little debrief um, on our last evening here. So Mackenzie, do you mind starting that up? Hey, my name is Tony Silvernell. I am the organic transition trainer for the Organic Association of Kentucky. Okay, so what is organic certification? Well, technically, the organic certification is basically following the rules and filling out the forms that are assigned by the National Organic Program. That would be going through um, the process of developing your OSP, which is your organic systems plan, being inspected and going for reviews. That is technically what organic certification is. And it's a way of giving the consumer a certainty of what you're actually providing for them. So, you know, there's a technical component of that, of yes, that is organic certification it is, you know, abiding by the NOP rules, but it's also sort of a validation for a lot of us. Is organic certification right for your farm? Now this here, again, this is a very personal question. Um, organic farming is not easy. Um, it is a lot more difficult from just a production standpoint. Um, you're not allowed a lot of, of the resources that are in conventional farmers as far as pesticides, a lot of those are not allowed, but also you're also required to keep records much more than you, you would do in any conventional. So, but it also comes down to like, not just that being a bare possible barrier, but you know, is it right for you, your family? Is, does this 
sort of go with your philosophy on you know how you want to produce and how you want to treat the earth around you okay now we're here to the gist of sort of the organic transition trainer this is one of the unique programs that oak offers for um, its members here in the state of kentucky it's a free service that we offer um, to growers and what it is it's essentially you'll contact brooke at oak she'll you'll fill out a form and then i'll get contacted and i'll come out and help you develop what's called your organic systems plan. That's the main document, sort of your business plan for your farm. And that's what you would do. But it goes beyond just developing the OSP. It's a matter of, I help introduce you, if you're not familiar, with the National Organic Program rules and looking at you know, how those rules can apply to your unique situation. Here in Kentucky, the main certifier is Kentucky Department of Ag, KDA. The National Organic Program, which is part of um, the USDA, basically accredits certifiers throughout the United States. KDA, obviously, is the big one here in this state. Um, EcoCert is another one, OneCert, OFA. Um, you can see them. Oregon Tilth now here is in the state of Kentucky. So those are other some certified agencies that are available to the growers. One of the advantages of K KDA, it's only 250 per one scope. Scope, when you're referring to production and certification, um, refers to whether it's a crop, a livestock processing, or wild harvest. Those are the four main scopes that NOP can certify. A little bit more in depth now on some of the things you'd look forward to doing. There's a basic application, um, and here this is on the KDA website. That's six pages, just some general information about your farm. The meat and potatoes of your organic system plan that's 22 pages, and that's just the form. In addition to that, you'll also have to have maps. You'll have to have your records. You'll have to have your receipts and receipts of purchases and your sales. This is all part of um, what's needed to get certified. Inputs, um, there are agencies um, around this country that KDA does accept. There's the OMRI, the Organic Materials Review Institute. That's the main one. And if you see an OMRI sticker on something, you can use it organically. But KDA also, there's some also some other major um, uh, groups that actually certify products to use in organic production. One's the Washington State Department. I got the logos up there the Pennsylvania Certified Organic and the California Department of Food and Agriculture. You know, going back to the um, farm maps, I always say this is one of the most important first steps when you're developing your OSB. It helps sort of define your working area, your production area, and it also helps you visualize. I'm a visual learner. So if you can visualize your fields and everything like that with something on the screen, and then you can then transfer that knowledge, give that to any reviewers or inspectors. You can sort of define the areas and then you can start looking at rotations and everything like that. This is something that I will help with as we um, develop the OSP. Record keeping, I um, touched upon that. You know, calendars, um, some of the plain folk that I've worked with throughout the state, I've had the pleasure of working with, they keep their um, all their information on calendars. And that's great. It's easy to access, you know, as an inspector, you can go there, see that. Excel documents is sort of what I use. I use a combination of writing it in a calendar, then entering it into Excel. Google Docs and like Mind Map, you're sort of like stepping up your game. Um, you're not just restricted to these. There are a lot of options out there. As long as you can keep good records and it's some keep them in a fashion that somebody reviewing you can understand. Here's a little bit of some of the stuff that I've done um, as far as seeds. You do have to keep you yeah, do have to keep a seed inventory. That's also part of your records and sales. Um, sales are important because as they go through an inspection, you will be audited and you they will do what's called a mass balance and a trace back. So um, those are just some of the things to look for that you will have to have sales and receipts and stuff available. You know, um, when you're looking at getting if you are can get certified organic. There is a 36 month transition. And if you just move on to land and the previous landowner can verify for you that nothing's been done for like four, three, four, five years, you can get what's called a previous land use declaration and have them sign that. And, you know, um, and not all land needs to be certified. If you're on a farm and you do have a split operation, yes, you know, just certify what you're going to be using for organic. And that is allowed. And you can actually run conventional animals on organic land. 
So there are different variances that allow for like a split operation. And to get started, um, you get to um, first to correspond with uh, Brooke Gentile. She's the executive director for Oak. She'll get back with you quickly and we'll get you on the timeline for working with a transition trainer here in this program. Additional resources, and this is something too that I'll introduce you to as a transition trainer. Join the Oak Network. Please become a member. It's great networking for everybody, getting to see what farmers are around you. You wouldn't believe how much that helps. I mean, not just from a financial, maybe sharing costs, you know, and everything being organic, but also from a psychological, knowing that you're not alone. If you're out in some county and you're thinking you're an organic grower, maybe it's good to know that there's other organic growers. And that's something that the Oak Network can help with. So just follow us on the social uh, media and questions here again, goes back to Brooke and All right, great. Well, we've reached the end here of our content for the three days. I'm going to tell a funny story on myself, and I think Dr. Besson will understand this and appreciate it. You know, I went through um, pesticide training, did the certification when I worked at the university, and the first time I sprayed in the greenhouses, I was so nervous. I was all masked up. I was all, you know, my suit. I had everything on, all my precautions. Um, you know, I did it successfully. I, uh, you know, followed the the specific instructions, uh, you know, to to unmask and you know get your gloves off the right way take the Tyvek suit off dispose of it so everything went fantastic went home that night and I had a nightmare that I did it wrong and all my hair fell out and I got sick and I woke up and I was so nervous that I had done something wrong um, so certainly those precautions I learned in those classes and um, all of that training it was really embedded in my mind and I still um I'm very careful about what I do, even things at home that are very low risk. I still um, have that nervousness about it. So I thought you might appreciate that. And I remember telling Bob Anderson that, about that. And he thought that was so funny that I'd had a nightmare about pesticide certification. But I don't have those anymore because I don't spray greenhouses anymore. But that was my, um, you know, brush with, uh, you know, uh, uncertainty with that. <laughs> well, it, it, it's good you did everything the right way. Yeah, I think so. Still have the hair, so I'm I'm good. But uh, but I do um, want to thank you for introducing that great information. You know, really good um, basic introduction for our folks. Certainly, if they have questions, encourage them to follow up with you. You know, Rachel, really appreciate you going through the equipment tonight and the content you went through last night. Um, you know, this was perfect for our beginning uh, growers, ones with not a lot of experience that really want to learn. And I appreciate all of our folks sticking with us um, through the three nights and through tonight. Um, you know, we really just wanted to give you some basic information, get you started, introduce you to some of the specialists that can provide some support to you. So really appreciate you being here, participating. Um, please fill out that survey when you exit out. Uh, let us know of future topics that you might um, want to hear. Um, definitely have some great ideas because of questions and content that we just couldn't dive deeply enough into. But you know, let us know what that is and, and we'll work on setting up additional training sessions. Uh, but again, just want to thank everybody. Um, if you've got some plants out there you're a little nervous about, you might want to take care of them, give them a little protection because we're going to have some cold temperatures. But it looks like we're going to have um, some fantastic temperatures the weekend and next week. So hopefully everyone has a great season. And please take advantage of these resources that we have provided and then look for an email next week. Um, and you can go back and look at this content and reference a lot of these uh, resources that different folks have identified for you. So thanks a lot and good night.